she could be a blue-eyed girl. She could even be a cyclops. It's not the important thing. <laughs> Passed all the tests. You pass rhythms, notes, and songs. So let's let's start the show. Are you keyed up to see Lou Black in about 25 yeah. minutes? Yeah. Well, first, you got to be with me for a little while, and I'm going to tell you something. You know, I I carry around a book. It's all the top 40 songs from 1955 through 1973, which is the year I stopped listening to popular music. <laughs> In my life, the lyrics to all those songs I kept hearing on the radio all those years, the, the words to, uh, are running through my mind, and some of those words are more important to me than the actual personal relationships and conversations I've had with the most intimate of friends. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> but it's like that, you know. A woman might say, I'm breaking up with you, Esty, in college, and I don't. Baby, like the de-evolution of music we went from yesterday love was such an easy game to play now i need a place to hide away. and you know when i find myself in times of trouble my mother comes to me speaking words of wisdom let it be we went from that to you know you think the world would have had enough of silly love <laughs> that part and I'll do the other part. Here we go. Five, six, seven, eight. Ah. Feels good, doesn't it? Feels good to dumb down a little, doesn't it? How can I explain the way I feel about you? I know it's true. Love doesn't come in a minute. Oh, wax poetic, Paul. Sometimes it doesn't come at all. But when you're in it, when you're in it, it isn't silly at all. I'll be here in Cambridge all weekend and blender drinks and have brothers. <laughs> I can see Paul McCartney rather than being Sir Paul and trying to put his art and his poetry upon us, like being in one of those, you know, kind of retro bars singing, singing till four in the morning. I can see that. Obviously, you can't. <laughs> I have to go back uh, to, to just escape the... the Detritus, is that the right word, of, of American popular music? Things get me bothered because I'm a composer, I live in New York City, and uh, you know, I write songs, but none of them have been on the radio. And it's, it's like, the stuff that I hear is just, there's one guy in particular, let me vent just a little bit. <laughs> His name is Jim Steinman. He's written for a number of artists. Uh, he wrote a song for Air Supply. <laughs> Hit. Once upon a time I was falling in love, now I'm falling apart. How can I say it's a total eclipse of the heart? He's also written all the material on Meatloaf's first and second records. <laughs> hell one, bad hell two. He's written all of Mr. Loeb's material. <laughs> That's what the New York Times calls it, Mr. Loeb. <laughs> The thing, the thing about a Jim Steinman song, it's, it's usually just, it's this kind of bomb. Let, let me get like a, a, a patch that's a little more bombastic here. He doesn't write songs, he just strings together old proverbs and cliches. A typical Jim Steinman song. You can lead a horse to wine, but you can't make him drink. And a stitch in time on a six Curiosity killed the cat. Satisfaction brought it back. <laughs> you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Watch Pot and Little Boy. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And no matter that, no matter us, make some bad time. 
Objects in the rear view mirror may appear closer than they are. I can't make this stuff up. And I'm sorry, uh, Jim, but when you look at the passenger mirror in a car, it does not say objects in the rear view mirror are, may appear closer than they are. I know you wanted that little metaphor for your little poetic metaphor of the past appearing so close uh, in retrospect. <laughs> Let's just break off into discussion groups and figure that one out. Jim Steinman's run out of proverbs and cliches. He's doing street signs now. It's Friends may freeze before on surfaces. Clothes cover before striking. And all employees must watch before they leave this bedroom. But I won't do that. Cause for years you've been making songs out of nothing at all. Out of nothing at all. I have to delve way back beyond the Steinman phenomenon. Back into the early years of popular music, 1961, 62, Folk City in New York City. And I carry around a, a, a little uh, a little music publication. I'd like to pull it up and uh, share it with you. <laughs> this is a little uh, a little musical booklet called Bob Dylan's Hits. Playable with three magical chords. <laughs> and uh, allow me to uh, read to you from the forward, and uh, I hope you'll allow me to put my glasses on. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the things which Dylan the poet says have never been said quite this way before. Likewise, the songs by means of which he sings his message are of a other style like no other. Yet despite the uniqueness of his artistic output, he has achieved his biggest success with songs so basic in their construction as to be understandable by music lovers of all classes and playable by performers with all degrees of skill. And he goes on to show you how to play those three magical chords on the guitar, the ukulele, if you're the kid from Deliverance on the front. Let's see if it works. Um, three magical chords. One, two, three. Come get on people wherever you go. Get into the waters around your throne. Except that it's soon you'll be drenched in bone. If your time to you is worth saving, then you better start swimming like a stone. For the times they are a change. Well, that's pretty good. How many roads must a man walk down before you? How many seas must a white girl sail before she sleeps in the sand? The answer, my friend, is glow in the wind and the hands are blown. It ain't me, babe. No, 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 it ain't me, babe. It ain't me you're looking for, babe. Kind of like the greatest polka hits of Bob. Playable with three magical chords. Take me on a trip on your magic swirling ship. All my senses have been stripped. And my hands can't feel to grip Wait only for my boot heels to be wandering I'm ready to go anywhere I'm ready for it to fade Into my own parade Cast your dance and spell my way I promise to go under it In the jingle jangle morning, I come following. Just three chords. <laughs> about myself. I live in New York City. I have an 11-year-old son, and on Thursday before I came up here to Cambridge, I, uh, I took him to his first day of sixth grade. And as I watched him walk through that schoolyard door, I started thinking about him, me, and our relationship. I started thinking about my, my late father. Uh, 
And uh, I started thinking about all those pop songs I was telling you about that walk around in my head. And there's been a lot of songs about fathers and sons that have. Uh, Kenny Loggins sang that one. People smile and tell me I'm the lucky one. <laughs> Danny song, or whatever it was. But Mike and the Mechanics, the Living Years, the Winston's Color and the Father back in the 50s, Eddie Fisher, all oh, mine, Papa. <laughs> to me, he was so wonderful. But there are two songs. In the, er, Eric Clapton has written a number of them, Tears of Heaven. So. Uh, I'll be lecturing at the new school uh, <laughs> here on this topic. Uh, two songs in the pantheon of songs about fathers and sons that really, uh, to me, uh, capture the essence of the relationship uh, between a father and his, and his uh, masculine progeny. Uh, uh, the first one is from the 1971 album uh, Tea for the Tillerman by Cat Stevens, who now goes by the name of Yusef Islam and uh, practices uh, Islamic religion in London and stuff. But back in those days, he was a pop singer. And, do you remember the album? It had, it had that uh, hit song, uh, Wild World. A lot of people don't know Cat Stevens recorded in a refrigerated studio. <laughs> things in his life, though. He taught the Bee Gees how to sing. How can you can come to me? I can't pop the whole pot out of my hand. I used to think the needle was skipping on my toe. Put a quarter of a roll of silver dollars on top of it. He also taught uh, Kermit the Frog. Why are there I'm just a big remover puppet with Jimmy Henson's ear the blind puppet. Oh, so you're that kind of crowd. T for the Tillerman, 1971 album. We've got this appropriately named song, Father and Son. First verse sung by the Father. It's not time to make a change. You're still young, that's your fault. So be calm when you find something going on. Take your time to think a lot. Think of everything you got. Because you may still be here tomorrow, but your dreams may not. Second verse sung by the Son. Why do I try to explain? What I do, he turns away. And yeah, it's always been the same, same old story. From the moment I could talk, I would all the time listen. Now there's a way, and I know that I have to go away. I know I have to go away. How many of us sing that song when we were running away from home at the age of 13? <laughs> Got as far as the local Orange Julius turn around their head and head. <laughs> Last verse of the song he combines in a in a contrapuntal, uh, centrifugal kind of way. <laughs> the uh, the two verses. So you guys be the father. It's not time to make a change. You're still young. That's your fault. Here we go. One, two, three. It's it's not time. Time. Songs about fathers and sons tied for number one. What I really like that is the bar and the bar keys. See the later, can I have them please? And the cats in the grill and the cell are small. Little boy blue and the man on the moon. If you're coming home, Dad, I don't know when. We'll get to yelling then, son. You know we'll have a good time then. 1980 released by the late Greg Harry Chapin. That's a great little about a father who never has enough time for his son, and ironically, late in life, like an O. Henry short story, <laughs> where the wife cuts off her hair to buy a watch bob for the husband, who sells the watch to buy a brush for the wife, 
The son has no time for his father. <laughs> <laughs> Saying goodbye to my son at that door, thinking about my son and me, and realizing that I'm living the exact opposite of that son. <laughs> my son was born just the other day. He came to the world in a new way. And it's been a long time since I was cast in a play. always working so when he's not in school you'll find my boy with me he'll be right at home with me and my son's playing Tetris or he's watching cartoons I sure as hell have oh dad gets a job real soon when you're going out dad I don't know when but we're having fun till then so I know we're having fun till then and as I made his macaroni it occurred to me my boy was sick of me. <laughs> surface of, we all know that, but it has a musical connotation as well. A lick is a piece of music that's repeated over and over in a song. You know, Beethoven says, we hear that often, that's a liet motif, if you will, but uh, there's one lick that, in my opinion, has changed the course of pop music over the last 20 years, and it goes a little something like this.
song, it seems, without hearing this lick, and it's like, Mary had a little lamb, a little lamb, she had a little lamb yesterday. that he is soaring to and heights even higher. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Lewis Black. Peter, what the fuck are 
was there some clamoring and I missed it? Who the fuck said, God oh, damn it, you know what I need? I need weather, all the weather. Oh. I want to keep in contact and I want to know where everything is. weather is everything.
an established friend, and you haven't got the common decency to serve a coat, well, I'm not going to come here anymore. I'm going to go over to buckets of shit. <laughs>
What is MTV? It's a video. Where does that go? I. <laughs> I here. Big fuck difference. <laughs> if, if you listen to a piece of music and you have a vision, and you go home and you turn on MTV, and the video of that music is your vision, kill yourself. <laughs> It's insane. Well, because when I think football, I think insane. <laughs> I was surprised to see them. I'd never heard insane, because when they come on the radio, I actually like to take a pencil and shoot. <laughs> and I'd never seen insane, because I don't track the fuckers. <laughs> and I was a bit shocked to find out that they are, are gay. <laughs> Yes, they are. I mean, they may not know they're gay, but they are really gay. <laughs> and that would have been enough. Just in sync, and I might have even learned to listen to their music. Because it would have been like a concert. That's fun. But no, in sync's not enough. There's never enough at halftime. And they bring on Aerosmith. <laughs> now I've got in sync. An Aerosmith. And I am confused. <laughs> These are two bands that shouldn't even be in the same state at the same time. <laughs> and now they're playing together and I'm thinking, what did the MTV executives, how was that decision made? <laughs> One MTV exec turned to the other and said, listen, we've got to come up with who's going to play the Super Bowl at your job. And they took a, a show and they backed him in the head. <laughs> and the day two, he said, well, NSYNC and Aerosmith. <laughs> And as NSYNC and Aerosmith began to play, it was not music that I heard. It was the sound of chaos. <laughs> I know it was the sound of chaos because you could hear pigs being slaughtered. <laughs> and the men were dancing their teeth. And I heard things that were so horrible that if I described them to you, you would flee from them. <laughs> <laughs> At that point, I had a vision. It shocked and disturbed me. And I'm a little embarrassed to share it, but the fact of the matter is, I, I felt that I'd, I'd rather be seeing donkeys fun. <laughs> I told you I wasn't happy about it. And I didn't want to share it, but I felt it supported. And then you, you don't even get me up if you do. You look at me and you judge. Oh, how? sit in my uh, uh, apartment in New York City looking at the TV pining to see livestock go at it. <laughs> but when you've got in sync and Aerosmith, I say, bring on the burrow. <laughs> if you're going to have donkeys fucking on television, an important point to remember is there must be music. <laughs> because if you're watching donkeys fucking and it's quiet, <laughs> that's perverted. <laughs> and Aerosmith would have been enough. But then they brought up Britney Spears. I had in sync Aerosmith and Britney Spears. I have the trifecta from hell. But I was lucky. Because I just happened to have a spoon in my hand. And I shoved it up my head. You may wonder why. Well, it was to distract myself from the pain. Because if I'm going to hurt that much, I'm going to do it to myself. <laughs> right? That's called empowerment. <laughs> I learned that on Oprah. <laughs> Next year, it's very exciting. Please catch the Super Bowl. You're going to enjoy it. Uh, airplanes are just going to fly over the stadium. They're going to drop shit on <laughs> Shit and fireworks. <laughs> The other reason I'm pleased to be back here in Cambridge is because I have uh, some extraordinary news to share with you. Uh, in my travels, I, I see a, a lot of things, but nothing was, was more extraordinary than something I saw this past year. 
It changed the way I looked, really, at everything. Because in the beginning of time, let's face it, man has looked at the heavens and believed, and really probably quite justly, it would seem to be common sense, that the universe ends out there. It doesn't. I have seen the end of the universe. And it's in the United States. And oddly enough, it's in Houston, Texas. <laughs> I know. I was shocked, too. <laughs> I left the comedy club there and walked to the end of the block. And there stood a Starbucks. And across the street from that Starbucks, in the exact same building as that Starbucks, there was a Starbucks. <laughs> And that, my friends, is the end of the universe. <laughs> People say to me, how do you know? And I say, well, go there. <laughs> Stand between those two Starbucks. Look at your watch. <laughs> Time stands still. <laughs> and if you look this way, immediately you think, you know, when I turn around, there can't possibly be a Starbucks. <laughs> that stupid. <laughs> and if they were a just and loving God, he was the one that turned shit to hell out. <laughs> so you turn slowly thinking, I'll see a Denny's maybe. Or a guy. Or possibly a mobile stand. But that's a star <laughs> People have asked the question, are there too many Starbucks? Now we know. <laughs> Starbucks across from the Starbucks, that's it. The game is over. You can build no more. Stop it. Stop it. What do you think the gentleman who was thinking, who stood in the empty lot, with his family, and looked across the street at the Starbucks that was already there? But he turned to his wife and kids and said, you know, I have a vision. <laughs> I'm going to build a star right here. Why would you do that, Daddy? Because it'll be the end of the universe. And it'll shit. <laughs> I pondered long and hard as to what people would need such a service. A Starbucks. Across from the Starbucks. <laughs> and there's only one group, and there must be a lot of them there. And these are people with Alzheimer's. <laughs> it has to be a group of people who can have some coffee in one of the Starbucks. <laughs> Go to the door and open it up. Look across the street. <laughs> you guys see what I see? <laughs> It's a start. I think it's time we had a cup of joy. I guess everybody's pretty excited, those of you who have gotten your tax rebates back. That's been a big help. Some of you didn't even get the full $300, did you? You got fucked. You thought you were going to get $300. They said, nope, you're only getting $37.50. who needed the $300, who were really desperate for it, who didn't get a check at all. But the rest of the country got the $300 checks. Lots of people. Do you know of any couple that got the check and looked at it and turned to each other and went, son of a bitch, look. Look. We're completely even now. <laughs> How did they know to send the exact amount? We're free at last. <laughs> $300? But it's insulting to begin with, and all it does is remind people how fuck they are! <laughs> We'd have been better off with a whole bunch of blockbuster video. <laughs> that way you can distract yourself from your pain for a <laughs> I have $300 out. What the fuck can $300 buy that the economy's gonna fucking take off? What the fuck is he doing? <laughs> it's the same. It's not just him. It's the, it's the Congress. It's a bunch of fucking idiots. Thirty-four million dollars is the what it 
cost for the U.S. government to send letters to the people who were getting the checks to tell them they were getting the checks. <laughs> I would be very interested to meet the gentleman whose idea that was. Because the words pistol whipping <laughs> never crossed my mind until that moment. And I would buy a pistol just to whip it. <laughs> Nuts. <laughs> if 
require removing it. It's the same amount. You can leave it there. Leave it there. <laughs> Scrunch up the form, scrunch into four <laughs> Then you'd have a short form, wouldn't you? <laughs> because I'm self-employed? That's what we call it. As <laughs> opposed to need psychiatric care. <laughs> See the donkey's fucking section. <laughs> Because I'm self-employed, they, uh, uh, they send me other forms that are incomprehensible. One has a question in it that I've read for the past 15 years. Every time I read this question, I drift away. <laughs> it's in the form IBQ30, kiss my dick. <laughs> hey, you probably read the question yourself. It's what is your non-farm income? <laughs> Some of them were fucked. Most of them got over it, but some were, ooh, damaged for life. 
You can see it. I'm in bars late at night. They've got a dark stare on their face. Having that last drink, they're thinking, fuck! If I'd only taken trade. Things would be different. Things would be better. I bet you wouldn't have left me. What did trade do for me? It put shit in my head. That's what it did. I went to a classroom for a whole year. Teacher went, shoved shit. Put it in. That's why I did drugs. I did drugs to get rid of that shit. The shit does not go away. It's actually brighter and clearer and comes in colors. <laughs> Sine, cosine, and tangent. No one uses those words. Well, I actually use the word cosine. When I call my parents and go, fuck me, you're gonna have to fucking cosine. <laughs> I guess, uh, I guess we're all pretty excited about our new president, aren't we? <laughs> well, it turned out a lot different than we thought, really. Because we thought it was going to be shitty, but it's beyond that. <laughs> it's a whole realm I never considered. I'm kind of fascinated by it. Watching him, because it's, it's been interesting. You see, I just spent nine months covering the campaign. And uh, I have to say that was the most exhausting, grueling nine months of my life. Uh, I, it's just by the grace of God that I'm not up here tonight with a gurney uh, on a gurney with an IV trip. <laughs> it was amazing. It was the first time that I, uh, in my lifetime, that we nominated two candidates who were equally shitty. <laughs> and they were equally shitty. And if you thought Gore was better than George W. Bush, uh, you're wrong. You're wrong. But because whatever Gore had that was good, Bush was shitty. But when Bush had something like that was good, but Gore was shitty. There were like two turds in Bernie. <laughs> <Gore. laughs> the problem with Gore, and it is a problem, and it's not bullshit. He is, he, when you watched him on TV, what did you think? You thought, well, you know, maybe if I shove my head through the set, the pain would stop. <laughs> Speak live. That was terrifying. My teeth tried to reach around to eat my brain. <laughs> nice. oh, it was an extraordinary. And then, but then, of course, we had options. There was Ralph Nader, but why the fuck would you vote for Ralph Nader so I could get a better warranty on the appliance? <laughs> You know what? That's fucking wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. You get a group of people who fucking nominate. You don't go out nominating me. That's bullshit. You didn't allow it in high school. We fucking don't allow it now. <laughs> Sir. I mean, even the, even that uh, reform party with that H. Ross Perot, that the, he he could get a party started, and this is the kid in deliverance all grown up. <laughs> hey, nominate Pat Buchanan. You can't vote for him, he's clinically insane. <laughs> how do I, oh, how does a normal person laugh? Oh, 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 you expel air. How does he laugh? <laughs> Senator. 
Some of these people come up and go, oh, I think it's wonderful she's a senator. Because she's not your fucking senator. You know? <laughs> I can't even fucking believe it. And she won. She won. And got, because Lazio was the worst candidate ever. <laughs> ever. It was, it was disturbing because he was a congressman. How did they, how, how did he win? <laughs> Who did the Democrats nominate? An otter? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody wanted the money with, well, we got to trust between Rick Lazio and... It's an otter. <laughs> it's just a picture of an otter. They didn't give the otter a fucking day. I don't think I could vote for another species. <laughs> and if the otter wins, then we got to go out every day and catch it and bring it back. People don't know if we have the right otter. <laughs> The debates were special, weren't they? I watched all four debates. I thought I'd rather, really, instead of those debates next time, I'd rather see two appliances humming at each other. <laughs> because at no point during that entire time did either candidate say anything that mattered at all. It was like being in a trigonometry class. <laughs> it was beyond belief watching them. And I got so angry watching them, and you men should take note, I did not know this could happen. Milk came out of milk. <laughs> Hit 
your hand in the Bible and go, oh, it's, it's, oh yeah, the, 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 your Genesis is all true. <laughs> you fucking out, you are out, you're out of your mind. You're out of your mind. Christ, I've been out of the sea, I didn't come to that fucking thing. <laughs> I've argued it all my life. How the fuck did I end up in a position having to argue for evolution? <laughs> evolution uh, happens to be a small part of a larger tapestry I call reality! <laughs> Fossils. I win.
tax in 61, okay, two, maybe three, red line, four, none. <laughs> and then they went in twice while he was, you know, recently, and they put some stunts in, and then just just a, a couple of three weeks ago, they put a, 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 a dynamite cap in his chest. <laughs> in their chest say that when their heart tank slows down and it needs to get redone, you know, it, it, it feels like a horse is kicking you in the chest. And doctors said he's okay. And I said, well, he's not okay, he's got a dynamite fucking cap in his chest. And, you know, you're the vice president, you can't have horses kicking you in the chest. He figured out he's the backstop. We got a president in office who doesn't, we're watching him learn how to be the president. Much the same way a, a kid is trying to catch a ball for the first time, and you, you have somebody stand behind him. That's who Dick Cheney is. A lot of the balls get through, and Dick Cheney runs. <laughs> How many times can he do it? I think he's in office to teach kids about death. <laughs> Somebody explain to me, first off, for why we had to vote on that. <laughs> Isn't that like a given? We're going to get clean water, we're going to do everything we can. I don't think we have to vote. <laughs> you know? The money, just get the money. I don't care, fucking get the money. I'm not paying a buck a bottle, fucking get the money! <laughs> it's unbelievable. Can't have clean water. Folks, again, you know, and, 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 if, and if there are people who are against clean water, maybe we should have a big nation recess and find those people and hug them. <laughs> because they're crazy. You can't be against clean water. If you're against clean water, what are you saying? I want shitty water. I want turds in my water. I want it to smell like urine. If you try to give me clean water, I'm going to go motor around my house, and the rain will fall, and piss some shit there, and drink out of that. It's good enough for the birds to go fuck yourself. <laughs> Most extraordinary thing, uh, Richard Dick Cheney was uh, working for, uh, before he got tapped to, to run for the vice presidency, he was working for Big Oil. He had been, much to his credit, um, someone who had worked in the public service for a long time. And then as all public servants do, he went and got a job in a, in a big industry because that's the way they get paid off. And that makes sense. That's the way it works. What are you going to do about that? And he was paid off, and it was great. And he worked for an oil company, he worked for International Oil. I mean, oil has no name. It actually has a name, but if you utter it, they kill it. <laughs> when he decided to run for vice president, he left his job at Big Oil. They gave him a $20 million balloon. That's what they gave him. They gave him 20 million bucks up front, not like over time, not a lot, 20 million. He said he would have no trouble being objective about uh, oil companies. And I said, because I'm simplistic, a liar, a liar, that's on fire. <laughs> you cannot. You cannot. It's, it's 20 million bucks. You can't remain objective. Nobody giving 20 million to be remain, remain objective. You either get to be the vice president or you get the 20 million. You can't have both. It's bullshit. If you're, if you're the vice president of the United States, I guarantee when you're done, you're fucking set for life, okay? There's no bullshit there. You go and make speeches, people go, ah, and they give you a big fucking check. <laughs> they talk about motivation, whatever the fuck that is. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, I get up every day and I turn off the alarm clock, and that's why I'm here today. <laughs> fucking unbelievable. But they do, and that's the way it works. You don't hear a vice president, you know, gets out of office and five years later, you go, yo, he was the vice president. Now he's a heroin <laughs> Nobody in this room, if, I gave, if, if Big Oil gave anybody in this room 20 million bucks, you, you couldn't remain objective about Big Oil. You'd love Big Oil. As a matter of fact, you'd be so excited that probably the first time somebody pumped your gas, you'd blow them. <laughs> out of glee, out of glee. <laughs> yeah. Bush has been interesting because he, he didn't sign the Global Warming Treaty because He's an asshole. <laughs> 178 nations signed the treaty. We look like idiots. Nations that can't even read what's in the fucking treaty signed the treaty. <laughs> he doesn't think there's global warming. A squirrel fucking knows there's global warming. That's <laughs> bad for business. Well, dead people are really good for business. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah.
kind of energy play is staggering, isn't it? So you took tremendous energy play. Both him and the Democrats and the Republicans got together on that one. Senator energy plan that's really great if it was 1957. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with any reality system. It's got, it certainly doesn't deal with the fact that certain things could be done. They constantly say, well, they, these things can't be done. Don't tell me you fucking can't do those things. You want to put money into it, things will be fucking done. And you'll employ people, you fucking idiots. In my lifetime, I went from a rotary fund, now I've got a fund that's so small I can shove it up my ass and the facts will come out. Right? <laughs> Six seconds, I have photos of tits on a bull at nine different <laughs> You're gonna bring back coal! They're gonna bring back coal! <laughs> Maybe next time I'm here, you can bring a candle I'll read to you from Dickens! <laughs> <laughs> got an education thing that's just beyond belief. Nobody's even, nothing, nobody's even standing up to that one. It's, 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 it's insane. <laughs> I mean, it's like, well, you know, the, the, you can't throw money at schools, they say. You, know, you don't have to throw the money at the school. <laughs> you go and hand it. <laughs> you hand it to teachers. Because they're not enough teachers across the fucking country. They're not making shit for fucking living. But an average teacher needs you know, to <laughs> Obviously, three teachers. <laughs> New York City, I guess the, the, the opening, the opening, uh, I guess the, what you can earn as a teacher your first year in New York is like twenty-two thousand five hundred dollars, which allows you to live in New York for a negative minute. <laughs> <laughs> Offshore off in a rowboat, fish. <laughs> what they're going to do is they're going to test the schools, and if the school, schools aren't good, they're going to shut them down. Well, there's fucking that's smart. <laughs> that's a real good solution, you know. In New York City, 50,000 students are without chairs. They're fucking, the classrooms are so fucking overcrowded that in any other culture, I think it would be considered like a, a, a catastrophe. It's an emergency. It's just, it's like, it's heinous is what it is, a word that I've rarely used. <laughs> and, um, but, I mean, you know, if, if these kids don't have chairs, what, what's the test going to be? Huh? What are they going to do? Have the kids lie on, the, on their stomach and then put a yes and no and they'll have to, you know, crawl to it? <laughs> When there's Clinton, everybody's kind of pining for him again. What the fuck? <laughs> the man who leaves office and basically um, uh, he pardons everything in sight. <laughs> He's pardoning inanimate objects. <laughs> <laughs> He's a man who pissed all over the presidency for eight years, got to the door, turned around, and went, oops, missed the spot. <laughs> A man of the cloth who impregnates and, and gets pregnant with one of the staff members, which is, I mean, and, and I didn't think was chastised enough. Because that, that's worse to me than a politician fucking up. I mean, a, a clergyman, you know, that's the deal. You know? Your deal, your deal is you keep your pecker in your pants fucking up. It's <laughs> not so, like, you know, no, 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 I can, no, you can't. Okay, priest, rabbi, any leader of any church group, that's the deal. We were all offered that deal. We sat in Sunday school, we went to, we went to temple, a church, and here's the deal. We went, we're, we're, fuck that! <laughs> becomes the, the, the spiritual advisor to Clinton during the uh, well, long job incident. Yeah. Now there's a sitcom. <laughs> what was that meeting like? Can you imagine? Well, I, I know you did something terrible, Bill. But wait till you hear what I do. <laughs> when George W. Bush speaks, I I do not understand what he says. <laughs> this, I think, quote sums it up better than anything I've heard so far. This is the way I think, this is what he's saying, this is the subtext of everything he says. Which is why most of what he says is almost, almost senseless. <laughs> I know what I believe. I will continue to articulate what I believe. And what I believe? I believe what I believe. <laughs> That's how people get asthma is here. Got nothing to do with the air. So you 
you got to touch me. Then your brain, that like by the third believe go, it's too many believe. <laughs> Come on over and tell them we're fucked. We're fucked. <laughs> In my lifetime, I went from Kennedy to, um, to Gore. I went from uh, Dwight David Eisenhower to uh, George W. Bush. I went from um, Martin Luther King to Jesse Jackson. If that's evolution in terms of leadership, I think in a few years we'll be voting for plants. <laughs> I'm excited by this. <laughs> I'm going to run a plant. His name is Phil. Oh, yeah. Plan. And I'm going to get him in the debates. And uh, you'll hear the Democrat talk. <laughs> and they'll be Phil. And he'll be quiet. But it'll be it'd really sat nicely because it'll be on a stool and his leaves will have just a little bit of moisture on them. And then the light will be perfect. And we'll play the way People will watch. And after a while, they'll start to think. I think I'm going to vote for Phil. I'm attracted to him. <laughs> and then Phil will become the president. And then things go to hell and you think, uh, what are you going to do to the, the president's a fucking plan? <laughs> spectacular to us and treated us very well. Rusty weeps every night in the dressing room. <laughs> <laughs> My parents didn't treat me this well. Like, shut up! <laughs> no, it's been a treat for us. because you know, I've been wanting to come back here for quite some time. It was very nice of them to bring us back. Um, and it's been a thrill. And, and before I go, I'd like to just share one thing with you that uh, when Rusty was saying that, this reminded me, Rusty was saying my career was going to reach new heights. Here, I just want you to remember this. During, on September 22nd, my career goes into a whole new thing. Um, I was sitting at home, and uh, I got a phone call from Norman Lear, um, which is pretty amazing. Really. I mean, that's, you know, you wait your whole life for that kind of phone call. Norman Lear's the man who produced All in the Family and Maud and a number of other shows that really broke the ground in television in a lot of ways, as much as a sitcom can break <laughs> <laughs> If I wasn't in Cambridge, I could have slid that one out. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so he's on the phone and we didn't see me at a uh, comedy festival in Aspen. He said, Lewis, uh, I got a, I'd like to offer you a job. And I'm thinking, fuck! <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing this my whole life. He says, you know, um, 